Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Shar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob L.A. Shar, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Before we get started with today's conversation, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. If you're listening to this on our audio platforms, please give us a five-star rating, download this episode, and subscribe, please, and thank you. I am very excited today because I have a New York City-based singer, New York-based singer-songwriter with, as of this recording, 2,000 TikTok followers and 3,200 Instagram followers. Please help me welcome Lauren Miner to the podcast. Hey, Jacob. Thank you so much. You are so welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for taking time in your schedule to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Likewise. I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate your time. You're so welcome. So I know that we talk off camera about New York. So are you New York City based or New York State based? I'm New York State based. Um, oh. I recently moved out of the city. So New York City is still home. <laughs> Same with, like I totally understand, Lauren, because I actually am reloc. I actually relocated from New York City from Ju- I was there from June 2017 to June to May 2021. So I love that city. It's still my home. But however. I'm grateful to be home back home in my permanent home of Oval Park, Kansas. But you got to live amidst living in New York City is pretty magical. There's no place like New York City. It's still my favorite place in the world. Uh, and we are not far. We're just an hour north of the city um, where we have a little bit more room and a yard for my little boys. So I totally agree because the thing <laughs> is, I love New York City, but there's no places for a yard unless you pay no. at least uh, $10,000 to $15,000 in rent. I'm like, exactly. no, sorry. <laughs> totally. Uh, it's a little more, there's a little more fresh air out here too, but we get back into the city whenever we can. Absolutely. So let's get started in, into our conversation. So when did you get inter- inter- interested in music and how did that passion evolve and desire to pursue a career in the recording industry? Sure. Um, I loved music and performing as a young child. I was like the kid who got in trouble for singing at the dinner table. <laughs> um, and I lived, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. So I was lucky to have access to a lot of really amazing musicians and opportunities growing up. I studied piano at Vanderbilt and, um, you know, loved everything about music, all kinds of music. I grew up really on like country music because that's what my parents listened to. Um, but I was also a writer and a journaler. Um, I have a box of journals that I've carried around <laughs> that starts when I was like, you know, I don't know, when can you write? In elementary school sometime. Um, and so when I discovered songwriting, I felt like I fell in love for the first time. Um, and again, being in Nashville, I was so lucky because my English teacher was a singer songwriter. Um, and so he taught this little songwriting elective class and I started writing songs when I was in high school and, um, felt like I found myself through that. Um, I ended up going, I ended up getting a master's degree. I, you, you mentioned that you liked the song Midnight Manhattan, which is a song that I actually wrote in high school about income inequality and um, like social issues. And I was always very passionate about that. So I ended up going into um, clinical social work. Um, And during my educational years, I was also recovering from an eating disorder. So I ended up treating eating disorders in my private practice um, and loved that work. Um, And probably it was the right decision for me when I was a teenager to go that route. I don't, I think, I feel like music wasn't, I just wasn't ready for that. Um, I had a lot of healing to do when I was a teenager, but when the pandemic hit, I was two weeks po- postpartum with my second child, um, and went through a really, I mean, like most of the world went through the most stressful year of my life and really felt like I had a lot to say through my songs. Um, and like, I needed to get heard and like, uh, I was ready to take a risk and do something really vulnerable and put my music out out in the world. And so in some ways the pandemic facilitated that for me because it allowed, I, I, it sort of caught me. I was, um, I had closed my psychotherapy practice, um, to have a baby and move from New York city to the suburbs. And so I was between, you know, it's not like I had a practice to go back to. 
Um, and it was just a moment where I decided to focus on writing songs full time and um, ended up writing my first album. That's incredible because the thing <laughs> is, I told it, I've also worked at a nonprofit before mm -hmm. after, on non business, non weekend hours, but like on the week. And I totally respect hearing all about our clients' stories and everything. So I mm -hmm. give you a hundred percent. And thank you so much for doing all so much good work for this world. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, everybody. That was a little sneeze. I didn't want to sneeze into this. That was some that. expert muting. <laughs> thank you so much. I was so impressed. Much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Anyway, let's let's talk about let's get into let's get into some of your influences. So, who I know that you said you were in Nash, you grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and mm -hmm. Vanderbilt because you pretty much blessed because that's the heart and cap of country music. It is. I didn't know it at the time. I totally took it for granted. You know, as a kid, you don't really know what you have until until you get out of your situation. Um, but it was I was really lucky because I had you know, family friends who were in the music industry. And I was able to do some cool internships on Music Row and um, interact with songwriters uh, in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. That's incredible because I'm glad you brought that up because I both you do, you were an intern at both, at Music Row, which is probably, probably, probably any music lover's dream, no matter if it's country or not, everyone has in, in, our, in, our, in our business, Revere's Music Row and the totally. left, right, and center, like studios of left, right, center, everything. So what were some lessons that you learned from those internships? Because it's not just major ball music, but Sony ATV and publishing, which is pretty, which is a, bit, which is a huge, heavy hitter it in is. our music industry. So what were some of the lessons that you learned from your internship that brought you brought you brought into your recording career? For sure. I think, you know, in the, at the time as a teenager, I wouldn't have said this. I don't think, <laughs> but looking back on that time, I think the biggest lesson that I took from it was that talent, there's so much beautiful talent in the world. Like there's so much art and so much music that we'll never hear and never see. And it's such a gift to have, to, you know, to be successful in, a, in, the, in the music industry as a recording artist. Talent is just the, the start, right? You also need a lot of opportunity. You need access. You need um, to work really hard on your craft. Um, and I think that perspective has really helped me take advantage of this time and this opportunity that I've had to come back to music, um, because I just feel like I'm all in and, um, and am able to sort of seek out, like it, it's helped, it's helped me just get really comfortable <laughs> with being vulnerable and giving myself um, or getting as much feedback as possible, even when it's what I don't want to hear, because I saw how much I, you know, there's just, there's so many beautiful voices and, and musicians in the world, like getting heard is such a challenge. And um, I just don't take that for granted, I guess. And I gotta say, the music industry has evolved so much since the last, since prop, since since everywhere. Because now it's like, I know they were looking at into like Britney Spears. Thank God she has, mm -hmm. she's back with some music with her and closer. It's fabulous, but also at the same time, we wouldn't be able to hear about Adele or Sam Smith or Lizzo mm -hmm. if they, if it was if it was yesterday's music industry standards for sure. And when I was, you know, back then, you there was no social media really to speak of. Was the I don't, I don't remember the, I don't know the history well enough, but certainly not, no Instagram, no TikTok, um, no YouTube. So it, you really were more dependent on a label. Um, but even, I guess, like just from a, because I am a therapist, I guess I look at it, I'm, I look at really sort of the personal development lens of it. And um, what I remember seeing are so many talented artists who had, who like got in their own way. Uh, because they didn't think that they were good enough to play on the record or they were like a beautiful writer and a singer who didn't want to perform. You know, th there's just so many ways to sort of get in your own way as an artist. Um, and it's such a gift to have the opportunity to get heard in spite of all of that. Um, I'm not sure if that made, made any sense. It makes total sense to me because okay. I love bringing in artists or like listening to artists' stories or like, Yes, it gets great to see if you have organic talent and it's hurt. It's frustrating when you have fabulous talent. At the mm -hmm. same time, you're not getting hurt. But I think social media has really helped some 
and for sure. other but like shows like idol or like the like idol got talent i look have gotten better at it of showcasing their talent but the voice unfortunately has lost its has lost its way because you can't have mm-hmm. in my humble opinion you can't have like at season after season like one two consecutively it's like that doesn't work because it doesn't allow mm-hmm. the artist to grow right Totally. There's so much, there's just so much personal vulnerability and investment that goes into being an artist and figuring out what you want to say and then actually saying it. Um, and it requires an incredible amount of support. And I know that there are some artists out there now advocating for like mental health support as a part of um, record deals, which I think is very cool. You know, there's lots of ideas out there to help artists be more supported, but I certainly wasn't in a place to do it when I was 18. And I saw other people who were already in the industry who were struggling. And I, um, I just, I, I remind myself that of, of that every day and like really try to put in the hours and the practice to make sure that I'm giving myself the best shot that I can. Absolutely. Because you're just one person mm-hmm. and you're just one person. And I think it's much better. It's, I think if people looked at this and say, okay, that you're, you're trying to struggle, but like, even though people have like a team of 25 people, there's still, Mm -hmm. we've seen people like Sean Mendes and Justin Bieber recently cancel their tours because of mental. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's, I mean, it's, um, it's huge. I think, uh, when I look back on my own path, I'm ready to do it now. I'm glad, you know, I, I really empathize with people who went into music young, right? And didn't have a chance to get, to figure themselves out. I mean, not, not that it was a bad thing to go into music young, but like (laughs) that sort of attention and fame and um, vulnerability can, can, can do harm. Absolutely can. And look what happened with Brittany. And like, she's just I know. recovering from that. And like, she's mm-hmm. just finally, finally broke for broken free. And I mm-hmm. wish her all the best as well. Me too. Me too. Their right. song is doing great. I've heard. I love Hold Me Closer. It's really great. One of the best tracks. I know it's a couple, three combined out in John's songs, but at least it's, it's better than any. It's better than like some of the stuff that's currently in the, in the top <laughs> I know. I know. Two legends. Absolutely. We're not here to talk about Justin or Shawn Mendes or Brittany or Sir Elton John. We're here to talk about you. So I would love to get to some of the stories behind your songs, including your recent one, Fools in Love. So could you describe the story behind that song? Sure. So I, um, as I said, was in quarantine during COVID with two young children and my husband without a lot of family around. We had no family around. So no, no childcare, no help. And it was a tough time with a new baby. And it really, I learned so much about my relationship in that time. And as a therapist, I used to, I like to think that I like know a little something about relationships, but I think that the lesson, (laughs) the lesson that I came away from that time was um, that you can't really intellectualize yourself through your own marriage. Like you can't therapize yourself. Um, And I really had to learn and to sort of have a more lighthearted view of conflict in my marriage. And so fools in love, I started writing one day when I was like so mad at my husband for something I don't even remember. Um, but I realized in writing the song that I was sort of, I was contributing to the conflict too. Um, and it's kind of about how, when, uh, you know, how hard it is to actually communicate in a relationship and how, when someone is feeling unheard, oftentimes they're also not speaking up for themselves. You know, like, so even if one partner's not listening well, then the other one also isn't speaking up um, to get heard. So um, I think it's something that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, and I, I love totally the agree. song. Yeah. I totally agree because definitely with, when I know, I know you, like you think, of, thank goodness that you're with your family in COVID, but however, I was in myself in my, by myself in my studio apartment until I, and during all during shutdown of phase four of New York City closing. So basically you're talking March, 2020 wow. to August, 2020. So before all that. So I, I'm i like, I'm grateful I was able to survive and thrive through that environment. Like thank God for FaceTime and everything. Mm. But it's, must, it, but it's very different. 
to well, I feel like that time was so challenging for everyone for different reasons. And um, while we had too much time together, you maybe didn't have enough contact with other people. Um, and, you know, we all, we all struggled. But this album really is about sort of the married with young children perspective on life, which I feel like my parents, um, it's just not something that I hear about in music a lot. Uh, and so I wanted to give voice to that experience. I totally agree because a lot of today's industries like basically is talking about let's get as like, especially with country and with the row countries, like let's go buy bear. Let's go, go dancing. Mm -hmm. Let's go have this. Or fall let's in love. Risky, let's fall in love and have a risky relationship. However, this could be lead to heartbroken being heartbroken, mm -hmm. which is a perfect segue to be talking because one of your songs is called Heartbroken. It is. And it's a different heartbroken. It's really about, um, you know, I wrote that song when I was postpartum during the pandemic and felt very brokenhearted about the state of the world and sort of confused about the kind of future that my children were going to have, which is a different... Um, you know, we were in very different situations during quarantine. But for me, I feel like the postpartum period is one where you're definitely vulnerable, but you're also very clear um, on what is important and what your priorities are. And it was hard to sort of watch the world burning and, you know, everyone, no, you know, I just felt like no one agreed on anything <laughs> and people were dying um, and the environment wasn't doing so well, um, that it was really sad. So I tried to put that emotion into my song. And you did, you did a beautiful job of it, but I gotta say one, the song that caught me, caught me in a good way was last generation, <laughs> especially <laughs> like this generation, unfortunately is going to be a last of everything. The last we saw mm -hmm. last of the Queen Elizabeth, the last time we saw a lot of different things, like a, a united country. Yeah. No, you're right. And it, I feel like, again, as a mother of young children, that was very much on my mind during the time when I was writing this album, where I just felt like I felt like I couldn't do much because I was nursing a child, you know, I was I needed to be home. Um, but I felt angry that we couldn't all figure out, you know, we couldn't all figure out a way to take care of the earth and take care of each other because I was looking at this innocent child and all of us started as innocent children, you know? So I sort of had this um, frustration that I tried to put in that song that like, um, if we don't kind of get it together, then we might, you know, that we might not have a future. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. one song I forgot, I got to talk about is Soul Tide. And it's mm -hmm. very, like, when you tie your soul to something, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I wanted in that song to write about, um, you know, there's a theory in, or there's kind of a way of approaching psychotherapy called parts work, where you think about the different parts of yourself and what they need and how that impacts your behavior. And I felt like the part of me that is a mother was, is, and still is soul tied to my children. Um, and yet there are other parts of me that want different things. Um, and I wanted to write about that feeling torn, uh, as a parent. Um, it, it doesn't only apply to having children, you know, choosing to be in any relationship, you, you give up other things, right? Like, um, so I wanted to try to put into the song, that feeling of being torn and then making the choice to stay. Absolutely. Because we, but the thing is, it was what with me, it was, I was basically torn about leaving New York city. But if I mm -hmm. stayed, I'm like, you do not want to be in the street during post post pandemic New York city. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm sure it was a loss for you to leave. And it was also it, the right decision. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And like, I'm, even though I'm not going having a chance to be at the talk shows or going to like being active, the people that I have, I'm mm -hmm. blessed to know that I'm growing, watching my niece and nephew grow up mm -hmm. and being giving impact to back to my community as well. So it is, there are some silver linings in everything. 
For sure. And in every, and any, um, this is a very therapist-y thing to say, but in any uh, growth moment, there's also a loss. Mm-hmm. You know, I totally agree with you on that. And I think that both of us, so like this, I think for not just for both of us, but for all of my audience as well, the past two years have really been a growth period. And like mm-hmm. actually been saying, we've been actually centering things, like saying, okay, mm-hmm. this pro- we've got to focus on this priority because we mm-hmm. spent what we strayed away from too long for another thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and we all had the opportunity to reevaluate what our priorities are, um, which is the silver lining, as you say, even though uh, I don't think any of us would have chosen the pandemic. Um, but it did give that opportunity. And for me, it gave me the opportunity to make this album because I think that um, being a mother of very young children, um, starting something new, the fact that the whole industry went remote really facilitated the recording process for me. I was able to do a lot of, um, well, all of the whole album remotely and a lot of the uh, recording of vocals and stuff in my own home, um, which allowed me to work quickly, even though I, you know, needed to be available to my kids and stuff like that. Um, so it's been a while. It's been a weird time. And I totally agree. We can, I have a whole lot of respect for every, for not just for you, but a lot of recording artists who did the work at home and didn't have to go down mm-hmm. to like these expensive studios or anything. Mm-hmm. No offense to the sound engineers and all those and wonderful recording studios because some of the greatest music of all time is there. But at the same I mean, time, it's modern. It was modern times. It's amazing to see about our per- perseverance and everything about using, about going and recording music and using apps like SoundCloud or using and using like audio. Totally. I will say that I really developed uh, a heightened appreciation for sound engineers and their particular technical skills in doing the album by myself because it is it's like an added challenge to try to use both sides of your brain in that way you know the part of your brain that develop that delivers like a really beautiful vocal performance is not the same part of your brain that like remembers to press record before you sing (laughs) so i i like really i came out of it like really appreciating (laughs) the sound and it's also very hard to get the sound right you know it's just such a skill um I just wanted to say that, like, I, I, I by no means think I can do it without, you know, that I can do it all myself. Um, but it was nice to have the opportunity to, to uh, be in my house. and be safe. I totally, I totally agree with you on being able to record a podcast in my apartment, or no matter if it's in New York or in Kansas City. But also, I do have to say, do you have to say this, I learned a lot from myself as well like being able to work on the audio skills on and use yeah. like of iMovie and garage band mm-hmm. yeah it's mm-hmm. a whole it's a whole different skill set absolutely and i think both of us have come out of the pandemic learning different skills for sure to say the least so as this podcast is probably going to be re- released after your album is if it's will be out mm-hmm. what are some of the ways that you uh, are you thinking about are you doing a, a virtual concerts? Have you thought about in-person con- events? And like, how would that help bring the message, the messages that are in Invisible Woman to a different audience? Sure. So I, um, I just booked a, um, an album release show in Manhattan for October 15th um, at the Red Room, which is uh, part of KGB Bar down, downtown. Um, and then I'll be, t- I'll be touring the album for the next year, probably just in the Northeast for now, but I'm also thinking about some dates in Canada. Um, so I will definitely be bringing, bringing the music to a lot, li- to live stages. Um, and you can find, as I book dates, they go up on my website. So if you're looking to see if I'm going to come play somewhere where you could visit, uh, you can check out my website at laurenminiermusic.com. Awesome. Awesome. So how are you, so make sure you do that. And also I got to say there is, I am miss going to a live concerts or a live events. It's the best. The one biggest live events I'm going to probably go to is New York Comic-Con 2022. And then also seeing my very first musical, like musical, actual musical on Broadway with Michael Jack, MJ the musical. So, oh, wow. 
So I'm looking forward, forward to being back seeing live theater again. I'm sure. I Me too. I haven't been to the theater in years, so I, I, I will hopefully be taking advantage of that too. But it's been great to start, you know, this summer, once my kids were vaccinated, um, I started doing some live shows and that's been really fun. Um, so I'm going to do as many of those as I can. And that's great that they get to see mom on stage too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So it's a big part of, this. yeah. Oh, I was yeah, just going to say that big, it's a big part of this for me is like having my kids see me chasing my dreams and taking a risk is important to me. And that will inspire your kids as well as your mm -hmm. fans' kids and a lot of mm -hmm. even your fans as well. Mm -hmm. I hope so. All right. So let's start. We got to start right now in conversation. So I really like that you're used, embracing Instagram and TikTok because I haven't found a way to <laughs> use TikTok to my advantage because I'm worried about getting down the rabbit hole. So what are some of your favorite social media and how have you and your team Set, set, determine which content is great to develop your follower, your following. What a great question. Um, I am definitely most comfortable on Instagram. Um, I am the Facebook generation for sure. Like Facebook started when I was in college, but over the past 10 years, um, I feel like everyone my age is on Instagram. So I'm very comfortable using that. TikTok is newer to me. Um, and so it's been a lot of trial and error. Uh, and I do a lot of intuitive content, particularly for TikTok. I kind of think of it as writing songs, like uh, just like, you know, trying to, it's, it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks uh, because TikTok is so hard to understand. Um, but for Instagram, I try to be a little bit more structured about it and think about how to bring my, um, really bring value to my followers and my listeners. So it's not just like asking them to listen to my music, but also bringing my expertise as a therapist and my experience as a social worker um, to help educate people and help them understand where I'm coming from when I write my lyrics, because that work really does inform my lyric writing. Um, and Instagram is a good place for that to sort of... Uh, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Have like a structured plan for how you how you promote your stuff. TikTok, for as far uh, there are people who are great on TikTok. It, it it's an experiment as far as I'm for me. I I don't know what I'm doing. I know I know what I'm doing. Like I love Instagram, and Instagram is the only way I'm going to show my. Has a lot of my listeners know that I say, <laughs> say I announce a podcast, and I also take you a little behind the scenes of what of my personal life is like, like, and like some of the people and content creators I've met. And that's basically it because TikTok, I'm worried to be like a rabbit hole and I have so much on my plate that I don't want to, right? And YouTube, right now, YouTube and Instagram are the only two places I will go down rabbit holes on. <laughs> yeah, TikTok is definitely made for a young brain, you know? Um, and there are people who, I, I guess my advice for anyone would always be like to hire, to if you can, to hire someone who knows what they're doing, because otherwise you really can waste a lot of time. Um, because the, what's amazing about TikTok is that musicians do get uh, discovered on there. You know, you can get an audience if you create content that's good. Look at Olivia Rodrigo. I know. And like, she I just got know. nominated for several ed for Grammys. I know she won some too. Yeah, it's like amazing um, to see a TikTok. Like I've never seen some anything like it that you can release your music on social media and then get rewarded by a Grammy with a Grammy. I know. Well, there's also um, Bridgerton the musical. Oh yeah. Are you are you familiar with those girls who are also on TikTok? They're composers oh, yeah. and they wrote. Yeah, yeah. So for sure. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm continuing to experiment on TikTok and see what lands with people. All right. Before, besides Instagram and TikTok, mm -hmm. and also where can they find your music? Also, where can they find out? Of, and I know that you plugged that when you go on live shows, where can they find where you're going to be going to? And also finally, besides TikTok and Instagram, I know what other social media platforms do you have? Sure. So, sure. Yeah. So, um, Instagram is definitely my, my home base and the link in my bio and Instagram has everything you need to know about shows that are coming up, links to my website, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm also on TikTok. I'm on Spotify. I'm on Apple music. I've got four songs out now, 
um, supporting the album, which will be out on October 14th. The album is called Invisible Woman. Um, there will be one more single that's also called Invisible Woman coming out in a couple weeks. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll be in the know about that. And um, I'm on YouTube. There are video lyric videos up for all of my singles on YouTube, as well as some live performance videos. Wonderful, wonderful. So guys, if you are if you miss any episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob Elias Show podcast, visit our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Spotify, and Spreaker. Jake's Take with Jacob Elias Show, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now you are in social media because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, Jacob Aishar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. And just to let you know, Lauren, jakes.shake.com, the blog that started off, is 11 years old this year. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Lauren. I really appreciate it. So if you guys want to hear, find some more articles, some interviews, reviews, find out what happened on America's Got Talent or on The Masked Singer, Head to jakes.shake.com. Once again, jakes.shake.com. Lauren, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. I really appreciate it. You are awesome. Likewise. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>